My name is Matt Sump. I'm Astrocam Account Executive here at Shopware. Today I have with me Chris Warka, Devin Glass, and Alex Zuniga from our applications team. Chris and Devin are down at our Indiana office and Alex is up here in Illinois. So overview of what we're gonna cover today. Each individual topic, I'm gonna go through some PowerPoint slides of some stuff that doesn't necessarily need to be demoed in Mastercam, but that we want people to be aware of. And then each one of our applications engineers will get into some live demo of some of the more important enhancements to Mastercam 2021. So Chris is gonna cover the general and design items. Then we'll pass it over to Devin and he'll, he'll cover the milling topics. And then lastly, Alex will cover the turning topics. And this is by no means comprehensive of everything that's new in 2021. So always be sure to check out the what's new.mastercam.com website and every individual item that's changed or been upgraded in 2021 will be on that website. And depending on the topic, it'll be just a little blurb like the stuff I'm covering or there's videos. And then when we get towards the end of the webinar, I'll also list some more resources where you can find out what's what's new in Mastercam. So let's get started with the design and general enhancements with 2021. The first one I wanna cover is anyone that's used to using the newer versions of Mastercam. So the first small upgrade I wanted to talk about here was anytime you're getting into the advanced solid selection and Mastercam is a good example, is you get a really large prompt that comes out of Mastercam. You know, you see that shift click, control click. So now there's an, an ability to simply suppress that. So you can right click the auto prompt there and it will minimize any time that you're not hovered over the advanced selection window or whatever the prompt is for Mastercam. And I always harp on this, especially with new customers, is this box is always telling you what Mastercam needs from you. So make sure it's a large font. Maybe it's a color that that stands out to you and you know don't hide it up on the corner of the screen because it might be as simple as press enter to continue. And you know, people call our tech support and say my Mastercam's frozen. And really that that prompt they you know moved on to a different monitor or something and aren't following along with it. Another enhancement to 2021 here is we now allow for 3D PDF creation. So this is a good way to share data either amongst coworkers or customers. And you do need Adobe Acrobat. So just the free version of Adobe Acrobat will allow it to work. I, I do have the full version on my computer here when I pull up this example, because I'm also our, our graphics guy here. So I have the Adobe suite, but um, it'll load the file right into Adobe and you can zoom and pan just like you would in the Mastercam window. And the other nice part is here too, is it'll it'll split out the PDF into multiple either levels in the file or the actual tool pass. So I can turn off the tool pass on and off here. And it'll also have the various planes and views that you have set up in Mastercam. So it's nice that a lot of that data translates over so that when you do share the document, people can get a better idea of what's what's going on. Next is another small change. Before in the operations manager, you could only see your world coordinate system and your tool plane, but now we also allow for you to view the construction plane per tool path. So that's as simple as you right click anywhere in that white area in the operations manager and click on display options. And a lot of people don't know about this in general, but you can really control what you do and don't see per operation. Because I know by default, some people have given me the feedback that it's a little busy. Well, you can make it as simple as you want by turning off some of those different descriptors in there or, or on if you want more information. You know, a lot of people put that toolpath manager on another screen and list as much information as they can. Next is another small change, but anyone that's used stock models, I know when I would do it 
before I would go through creating the stock model and I'd hit the green check and it would say, you need to create a name and you no longer need to enter a name. It will just auto populate a digit, the number one, and then increment from there. And then you can always change it. Or if you have the same name, the next stock model will add an underscore one to that and underscore two and so forth. We also renamed on the source operation page, the five axis tip only to mill flutes only, just so it makes a little more sense to users. What this will do is on your tool assembly, so say you got the holder and the tool, if you have the mill flutes only selected, it will only look at the cutting portion of the tool when generating the stock model. So this A is good, and this is why I think they called it five axis before, because you might be doing some five axis tool pathing and not necessarily worrying about collisions yet. So the stock model will process a lot faster if it's only looking at a portion of the tool as versus the full assembly. So conversely, you can uncheck that if you want to make sure to check it amongst everything. But a lot of people use verify or black backplot to learn where the holder and other components of the tool are going. A bit of a larger change here. So Mastercam has a function called raster to vector if you're not familiar and what that'll do is will it will convert an image into 2d wireframe geometry right inside a master cam it was rewritten from the ground up and what i always recommend to people when you're first getting started there's a lot of options in there on how it creates the geometry whether it's arcs splines lines i always recommend the lines, corners, arcs at 200 DPI with a fine accuracy. And my example picture here, this is a zoomed in screenshot of the Mastercam 2021 logo. This is part of the zero of the 2021. So on the left-hand side here, I have, you can see all the little jagged lines where it's picking up the shaded area where the image transitions from gray to light gray. And on the right-hand side here, you can see it's a nice, smooth, single piece of geometry. And throughout this whole logo in 2019, you know, we had about 10,000 pieces of geometry where we have about 300 pieces of geometry in 2021. So every test that I've, I've done with the new raster to vector is it's infinitely better than it was in previous versions. It also calculates a lot faster from what I've seen. You have additional control now of transformed entities. So anytime you do a transform com command, if you go over to the advanced tab, you can independently control the color and the level as you're doing the transform, where before you'd have to do the transform, select the transform geometry and modify it from there. So when you do the transform, you're still gonna get, if you have your colors set to default, where the red is the existing, or Pink is the existing and red is the result or vice versa, I, I forget offhand. But then when you right click and do the clear colors, the transform geometry will, re will respect the color that you assigned and it'll also move it to the level that you assigned. And there's also a checkbox there if you do a multiple instance transform where it'll increment the levels of the items. So another small change, but just to further improve in the way we can keep your files organized. We've re redone and improved the notes function in Mastercam for 2021. So it's moved to like a lot of the design elements in Mastercam have over the past couple versions into what we call the function panel interface that goes over on the left-hand side. There's now different point and curve options on where you wanna place the text. And then there's also, Oops, let me go back here. There's presets here that's highlighted there at the bottom where you don't necessarily need geometry existing to create the text on an arc. And then you can also now convert legacy notes. So if you have notes coming from 2019 or 2020 and prior, there's a little button there at the bottom corner of the editor that I have highlighted on the screen now where it'll convert it to the new style note. Just be aware that the old stick fonts and a few of those, there are similar what we call true type fonts because that's what this runs on now, where it will convert it to a similarly styled text. That'll look the same, but it will be technically a true type font. But what, what that also allows then is any font you have installed on your computer, you can get in as a note 
in Mastercam versus just the create letters command, which was the one that the only one that supported true true type before this. There's also now a function for detecting and creating custom holes. So we added a couple versions ago, the find history function on the model prep tab, but it will now also pick up the various features of say a complex hole like I have on the screen here. So that's on the model prep tab, like I was talking about, and then the add history. So it'll it'll do more than just the actual solid body and picking up regular extrudes or lofts and different solid functions like that, but it will add all the whole data in there now too. So that's all I had as far as slides are concerned for the design general portion. So the, these are the topics that Chris is gonna cover. So I'll leave that on, a, on the screen for a second while we transfer over to Chris. So uh, I've got a few things to show you today. Um, the, the first one here is a little bit about some surface modification that they've added to 2021. Uh, some of you may have tried to use a flow line tool path before and, and gotten uh, either kind of mismatched results where the flow of, of the tool path wasn't quite what you wanted it to be, or possibly a warning that came up and said the surfaces don't form a row, uh, which is pretty common depending on how it was modeled. So I've, I've got a few surfaces here that if we wanted to apply a flow line tool path to, uh, it may not work out quite the way we wanted. You can see if I turn the shading off here, we've got a little bit of a mismatch in the overall direction of our surfaces. So they've added a few new features here, uh, edit UV and reflow UV. We'll start with the edit UV. And with this one, you can pick either single surfaces and modify their U and V direction, kind of the grain of the surface, if you will. Or uh, we can pick a bunch of them at a time. In this case, I'll pick all these surfaces. And you can see here, uh, the UV directions are kind of all over the place. We've got some going different directions and we can flip individual Vs or Us by clicking the arrows. We can swap the U and V. So you can see here the U and the V are, are changing their orientation. If we want to affect them as a group, we can switch all the U's and V's. We can flip the U direction or flip the V direction. So uh, we've got individual control. We've also got uh, overall control over the group of surfaces. But in a lot of cases, what you're trying to do is get them all to kind of flow together, align with one another. So we've got this option here called propagate, where if we select that, we're gonna be asked to pick a seed surface. And this is gonna be the surface that kind of dictates the direction that all the others are following. So if I click on this surface, you can see now all my UVs are going the same direction, a little less work than going in and trying to click them individually and flip those around, <laughs> excuse me. Um, and if, if I apply that, you can see we get a little better alignment of the surfaces there. Uh, but a more powerful tool is going to be this reflow UV, where you can see these still don't quite line up the way I like. And if we use the reflow, we can pick, you can only pick a single surface with this one. So we're dealing with one surface at a time here. Um, and I have the option for either using boundary chains. I'll show you that one here in a moment. Or if you want to kind of manually rotate it, you can pick your little dial there, like we see under a lot of the dynamic planes and things like that. You can adjust the angle of the U and V manually here. But ideally, what we'd like is for that surface to be uh, a little more kind of down the middle, if you will. So if I choose some, uh, I've got some wireframe here that can help us align these um, these U's and V's. So if I chain my boundary for that surface here, 
and those would just be you know surface edges it's going to align itself directly kind of down the middle of those chains um, and if i apply that one you can see now we have a real nice flow in the in the grain of that surface there so very powerful tool that they've added um, like i said if if some of you use flow line you know the dangers of trying to use uh, especially a model that was not created in mastercam and, and getting that flow line to work so let's switch gears a little bit here um, i'm going to talk a little bit about some 2d stuff now i'm sure most of you have probably used divide before we can get that under the wireframe menu here we got divide and you can remove a section of line here or trim off little tails like here. Uh, but what you may not have known is that divide will allow us to do a drag. So if I start up here and drag my mouse, you can see it divides all those lines that I drag across. Well, they've added that to trim now as well. So if I go into my trimming, and I drag across this corner. I had it set to trim two entities. You can see it trimmed both of those corners. I can do this. If I happen to go a little too far, the undo still kind of works, uh, you know, one at a time. They've also added that same option into fillet. So again, if I drag across some corners here, you can see I can really quickly fill it some corners. And they didn't forget about chamfer either. We've got the option to drag across a corner and, and chamfer it. So a uh, pretty powerful tool there. I like less clicks. Those of you who know me know I'm all about less clicks. And uh, if we can save a few clicks, that's always good by me. Uh, and I'll show you a little bonus feature here. This one wasn't on the uh, agenda, but if we want to mirror this geometry we have the option you know to mirror about the x mirror about the y well they added both to 2021 so uh, now we don't have to mirror twice saving more clicks and the next thing i'm going to show you here is a little bit of chaining enhancements um, and this is the red and purple that matt was talking about for group and result colors there we can clear those off but if um let's say we wanted to cut out these little areas here if i were to throw a contour tool path on here uh, i'll do some partial chains here and chain each of these um, as most of you are probably well aware if you got one chain you can reverse that chain but the minute you start a new chain your previous arrows disappear. So if I were to chain one of these going in the uh, wrong direction and continue on with my chaining, uh, it's very easy to overlook that, have a tool on the wrong side of your geometry. So they've added this option here to display all your arrows at once. And by clicking that, you can see all your chains and the direction that they were going. Hopefully you can catch some you know, chains that might've been going in the wrong direction here. We can select on an active chain in order to modify it, and then I can reverse that. Now, what we got rid of, there was a button here um, to, we have unselect, there was an unselect all here. If I did happen to want to get rid of all these chains, I can pick display all chains again and then unselect. It gets rid of them all. So a few enhancements in the chaining there. Um, and there's also some enhancements to solid chain, which I don't have a solid up here on this particular model. Let me go grab one that does have some solids. So on this particular model here, Let's say we want to machine finish all these blue faces and uh, we can do something simple like a contour here. Again, 
because solids are the only thing visible, it automatically defaults to that anyway. And uh, if I want to pick just an edge, I can pick these edges here for all of our square walls. Again, you can see the arrows kind of disappear as I go around there. Uh, we can bring those back with this. I will do that here in just a moment. If we want to pick the walls of this little pocket area here, we can tell it uh, outer shared edges. You can pick this face. You can see it ignores the holes. Those are not outer edges. Those are inner edges. And it's only picking the ones that are shared. And I can, once again, you know, display all the arrows here. I'll do that here in just a moment. If we forgot about some clamps, obviously we got a couple chains here that might uh, violate our clamps, might make the part easier to remove, but probably not making good noises. So if I want to go in and modify those, we now have the option, of course, to display all my arrows. And if I choose to edit, say, this wall here, so it's not going to just plow through my clamp. I can pick the chain in question, and they've added the option to dynamically adjust the start point of our chains or the end point. Uh, so if I pick dynamic, it's going to ask me which end I want to move, the start or the end of that chain. I can pick that arrow and I can move it a little further down here where it's going to be past where my clamp is. And, you know, if we need to adjust other chains in the mix there, once again, we can display the remainder of our arrows. Pick the arrow we want to move. Use the dynamic to scoot that a little further down so that we're starting on the back wall of the pocket there where we could avoid the, uh, the clamp. So a few pr pretty nice options there in chaining. Uh, I really do like the ability to pull up all the arrows at once. I've had a lot of options where, you know, you, you get uh, carried away with your chaining and forget to flip one. Once you've gone past it in 2020, there's no going back. So now we have a little more options there. The last thing I'm going to show you is uh, a couple of modifications they made to the bounding box. So let me start with one. For you lathe guys out there say you've got a, a part you want to set up some stock so that you can turn this part um, this part is not necessarily oriented in a turnable position so if we go make a bounding box on this i could pick my model and typically, um, it's going to be set up for a construction plane. So you're going to get either X or Y axis cylinder. If your part is not aligned with one of those two axes, you're going to get some pretty inefficient uh, stock. We now have the option to auto orient that bounding box. So it will create the cylinder um, with the most optimum use of our material there and you can still expand this you know we could come in here and say it's going to be 12 by 140 millimeter this one is a metric part and if we choose to make a solid on this uh, that can help us to align this part because it's still going to be in kind of a weird orientation at the moment if I make a solid out of that, you can see we've got our solid here, our parts buried inside there. We've got the option, not a new one necessarily, but the uh, new solid that we created here, we can align that to the Z using this end face. You can see it's going to either create a plane or more likely if we want to move it to the top plane, we can always tell it transform to the top plane. 
The catch would be um, if we move this, it's just going to move the stock right now. We have to make sure we move the part with it. So we can add the additional. I'll just pick everything. And that will align us back into a top plane with our Z axis going in the proper direction. So if I fit that to the screen here, you can see we've got our origin right there at the face. Nice turnable position now. And, uh, you know, again, if I turn off my stock, you can see our part there. So some pretty nice enhancements there for bounding box. Uh, and we didn't forget about mill guys either. Don't worry. I'll show you a couple other features for rectangular stock. So, you know, same kind of deal if we go do a bounding box, we pick our model. It's still set up for a cylinder uh, for, from my last one there, but if I go with rectangle, I'll set this back to construction plane here. If I go with rectangle, not a bad bounding box. But again, if we go with auto, you can see our dimensions for our stock will change a little bit here. Get to save a little bit of money on some stock maybe. But we've also got uh, some wrap functions that are pretty slick. If we do a wrap, uh, the default option here is silhouette boundary is going to make kind of a, um, I don't want to call it 2D, but you know, you, we get some nice straight walls out of it there. This would be great if you were, say, water jetting out of blank to machine this part from or flame cutting. You know, a nice tight bounding box around there kind of follows the shape of the part a little better. There's also minimum volume. And the minimum volume option is going to give us a very 3D bounding box. And, and you know, this could be used for if you need to make packaging material, um, you know, something that just surrounds the part. So you need to ship this out. You want to create a, a container for it. We could use that minimum volume to create that. So again, some uh, fairly powerful options and you can make solids or polygonal meshes out of this. You know, again, if you were gonna flame cut this out, we can make a solid out of that and it'll create a solid for us. And uh, the one final thing that I nearly forgot to show you here, um, they did add something to our wireframe creation here too. which um, some of you may have run across this before. You know, if, if I'm creating, say I want to make a boundary that includes one of these little finger areas here. The, uh, the new option that they've added is this automatically determine Z depth. Now, typically, if you're sketching using um, endpoints, auto cursor selection, it's going to snap right to that if you're in 3D mode. So, you know, if I sketch something out here, say I just want to kind of eyeball it, these two picks here are not auto cursor picks. I wasn't snapping to a piece of geometry. So what we tend to get is you know, something a little bit like this, where it's not respecting um, the original Z depth, but rather using whatever Z depth you might be set to draw it. So, um, <laughs> excuse me, not exactly ideal in some cases. If you wanted a nice flat boundary, that uh, did not make a flat boundary for us. But if we turn this on, it will kind of respect that Z depth. So, if I was to sketch something kind of similar here, even though these picks out here are not on the uh, they're not snapping to a point on the model you can see that it kind of 
took its cue from the original depth here and automatically determined the z-depth for our other points. So pretty nice little option, uh, for especially for making containment boundaries for 3D tool paths. A lot of times we'll just sketch those in and it makes it a little cleaner when it's all at one depth. So uh, I think that's all I had to show you today. I will pass it back to Matt. Thanks a lot, Chris. That was some good enhancements there. Mill 2D, 3D, multi-axis enhancements here. So the first one I wanna cover on the 2D side is you now have an option to swap your lead in, lead out, and there's also a new profile ramp lead in option. So before you had the two arrows there to switch you know, the entry to the exit and vice versa, but it would just copy your settings from one side to the other. But there have been times, you know, where your exit's exactly the way you want your entry to be. So you can swap them and it'll switch the exit over to the entry and the entry data over into the exit side. And then we also added what we call profile ramp for lead-ins. So what that'll do here is it's going to be perpendicular to the direction of the tool path. So you can kind of see there it's it's going up in Z and then leading onto the part. So there are certain scenarios where that should be beneficial. You know, these these were a couple of small enhancements that were user generated. And that's what I usually talk about when we do the in-person webinars is there's so many features in MasterCam that are direct products of Shopware customers. So if there's ever anything you see that, hey, I want MasterCam to do this, or I wish it would do this, so I'd have to do less mouse clicks like Chris likes, you know, feel feel free to send send those in. And you know, being one of the largest dealers in the world, we we certainly have a have a good good say in you know getting that data to what they call the QC department at MasterCam, and they'll either put it in as a request number or give us additional feedback on if that's a viable upgrade. So there's now a new setting for arc fit for linking 2D tool paths. So before this was more only a 3D tool path option. And you also have the option now to output a feed move. So what that means is my next picture here with both options off, you'll get what you're used to seeing on a 2D part where once you get to your retract point, it'll retract up straight and then wrap it over where now you can see it's a it's a feed move and in an, an arc fit. So this was another request from people, you know, depending some some older CNCs when they switch from rapid to feed can create some some jerky motion. So if there's a lot of retracts in the given part, it can be a little rough on the machine. So this can just smooth smooth things out. And if the radius is too small in that setting page I had there, well, let me go back one here. If, if the arc can't fit, it'll, it'll create what they call a 180 degree arc and loop around. There's another new setting on the mill 2D side for circle mill helix bore. In previous versions of MasterCam, it was a bit of a workaround to get the tool path to end at the center you would have to make sure your lead in lead out parameters or some other settings, or you had to draw some geometry to get the tool path to end right at the center of a given bore. You know, say it's a really tight fit and you're doing a real tight helix bore. Now you just click that button and it'll move back to the center before it retracts back out of the part. Also for thread mill tool pass, there's a new setting here to lock the active teeth in the thread pitch because MasterCam automatically calculates a lot of these values depending on what you're editing, you know, say the thread start angle or allowance overcut and so forth. So now as long as you lock the pitch and the active teeth, those won't get modified even if you modify other values within the thread mill. So again, another small change, but just a quality of life so you don't mess up your thread pitch. We also added, this has been a feature in the 3D side for a while, but we have a, a skip pockets function. So what that allows for is say you have a, a 2D part with a bunch of pockets on it and you're using a half inch end mill. 
try your in 2D dynamic mill, if that pocket was big enough for the tool to fit in there, it, it would machine it every time. But this way allows you, it's either based on a size or a percentage of the tool. So if a pocket was small enough, it would ramp in or use whatever entry motion you have assigned and then just re retract back out of the pocket. So you wouldn't necessarily get any cutting motion. It would be more just entry and exit motion. And you also have the option there to skip skip all pockets if you're saying just trying to do flat lands or open pockets on a on a part without necessarily chaining it. And the skip all function there too is was also added to 3D Opti Rough for 2021. There's a couple new settings on leads and transitions, getting into more of the 3D side here. So it's one extra box and a and a checkbox on your linking parameters page of any 3D tool path. And an example of that I have here is if I turn extensions on, you can see that that green section that I have highlighted with the arrows. When I add the extensions, it'll it'll lead farther off the part per pass, depending on where the motion of the tool is going. You know, I, I still have the purple there where it's doing the trans short transition per pass, but anytime you say want to have the tool completely go off the part a little farther, you know, say you're really concerned with surface finish, and that leads into the next option that we added in here, the apply transitions, which I have a screenshot for that too, where you can see on the left-hand side there, there's no transition selected. Where on the right hand side I have the apply transitions and that'll that'll apply the say the ramp or some of those other settings like the horizontal arc entry, vertical arc entry values per pass where where that wasn't available before. So you can see each tool path there, it'll it'll sweep down onto the part per pass as opposed to just going back and forth. So you know if you're getting some some drag on the tool. And like I was saying a minute ago, really concerned about surface finish, you can control better the engagement of the tool per pass on a 3D tool path. Getting into the smaller 5X or multi-axis options here, multi-axis rough is now named multi-axis pocket. Because I think before people were, oops, if I could get my screen right here. There we go. So that's the 2020 multi-axis toolpath window. And on the right-hand side is the 2021. You can kind of see we, we cleaned it up even further after the overhaul of that for 2020. And the pocketing was renamed because I think a lot of people were getting confused because it didn't work that great if you were, say, doing the outside of the part and there were no walls for you to pick off of. Because the way that toolpath works is you have to define the sides and the floor for it to calculate the tool path. So it's now been changed to pocketing so that you know that you can't use it on like an outside of a part. Cause even that, that old graphic was a little misleading cause a shape like that would be really tough to do in this particular tool path cause there's no walls for you to assign. And part of the reason we added that too is there's now undercut support on this tool path and there's also finishing options in there. So, so what they've done is they've enhanced the back end of this tool path to handle what we call the accelerated finishing tools. So that's the circle segment and the barrel style tools from Amugi and a couple of the other tool manufacturers are now supporting those as well. But if you search on YouTube, Mastercam Accelerated Finishing, you, you can see examples of it where those circle segment tools, you can take a, a ball nose step down of say, five thou per step where those circle segment tools can do 120 thou per step. So you can really reduce your finishing time. And now even on the roughing and finishing side too, using this particular tool path. There's also been a lot of enhancements to morph. So prior, you needed wireframe to determine where you wanted to morph to and from. So people that aren't familiar with morph, think of morph as like a blend tool path, but in the five axis world. So there's now this option to extend edge curves under the advanced settings under the cut pattern. And like I was saying, you previously needed 
wireframe. So to achieve a tool path like the picture I have on the screen now, you would have to have wireframe here in order to determine that, where now you can just pick off the edges of the solid and get the same result. And since that wireframe was only drawn to the edge, not all the way out to the end of the part, but just the edge of that wireframe, before you would get a tool path that looked like this, where it would start to curve off in a way because you were past the edge curve that you assigned. But now with that extend option on, you get the correct tool path with the extend edge curve here, where it maintains that same step and direction of the tool path without needing additional geometry out to that particular location. So you could just pick one of these edges of the solid without drawing wireframe, and you get a nice clean tool path on a particular face. We've also done a lot of performance enhancements to a handful of the multi-axis tool paths for 2021. And I have the ones high, highlighted there that have been redone. So it's morph parallel along curve and project curve. So you're, from a general point of view, you're gonna get smoother and faster, both calculation and tool path. And what I mean there on normal resolution, you know, if you're dealing with a surface model or even a solid model, there, there'd be times where the tool path wouldn't move in the direction you were thinking, even though it was following the same surface or solid face. And the way Mastercam calculates the vectors, of the tool path or where that five axis tool is coming from will be more consistent. So that's gonna allow for better surface finish across the board. And you'll also see a lot of performance gains. And I was actually working on a demo part for a customer yesterday doing some parallel tool pass on a, on a three plus one rotary part and uh, using the parallel tool path and it was calculating before it seemed like as soon as I hit the green check mark, which you know I'd, I'd never see that in 2020. And I think this might be the last mill slide before we pass it over to Devin. There's a new function here called check tool reach, and you don't necessarily need to have existing tool pass for it to work, because you can see here, I can, I have a manual option on my screenshot there. I can just put in some details of a tool without having a tool assembly already assigned to check what I can and can't get into. And this is a screenshot of the part that, that Chris was working on, but it's gonna be on the mill toolpath page right next to the utilities where we added that check holder function from a C hook into the main Mastercam, I think in 2020 or 2019. And then right next to it is that check tool reach function. So you, you can use existing tools from your library, or like I said, you can just type in some basic values of the tool and it, it'll give you some visual feedback of what sort of length of tool you need before you even get into starting to tool path it. So those were all the slides I had on the link side. So we're gonna pass it over to Devin and those are the topics he's gonna cover. Alrighty, well, hey guys, um, I'm gonna be tackling the mill portion today. Um, I'm gonna be kind of, blazing through because there's quite a bit on the docket. Um, first thing we're gonna talk about here is the new chamfer drill. So I got a little part I drew up, kind of like a weird fixture thing I, I threw together a couple days ago. Um, but uh, as you can see here, I have some counter bore holes and some dowel holes, and uh, I, need a, I need to basically spot drill them and maybe put a consistent corner break on them. So let's say the print calls out for a 10 thou corner break. So I wanna make sure that's consistent. Well, previous master cams, we'd have to, we'd have to make a drill tool path for the dowel holes and a separate one for the counterbore holes. But with this new chamfer drill, pick a chamfer drill tool path. And I'm just gonna pick the top of these holes in the order I want. We have access to sorting and all that good stuff from the drilling. Green check. Pick my tool, that's spot drill. And now we get in the cut parameters, and this is really bare or, or stripped down from probably a lot of the other tool paths because a lot of this stuff is going to be kind of more uh, automatic and what it's doing a lot of math in the background. So what it's using is it's using the depth of the arc that you've chosen, whether it's a wireframe arc, a edge 
arc or a hole, um, and it's using that to calculate how far the spot drill needs to go to get the, the desired chamfer. So in this case, I said I need a 10th out corner break, so I'm gonna put 10th out in there. Quick note, you could do multi-axis with this toolpath just like any of the other drill toolpaths when they introduced that to 2020. And for the linky parameters, note that this is locked to incremental because, as you can imagine, uh, this is made to calculate the depth depend depending on where the geometry is and what size the geometry is. So we want to make sure that that's incremental. Green check. Now, it's going to be hard to see, so let me go ahead and send this sucker through the verify. A second to load up. Whoop, my bad. Let me uh, fix that real quick. That was a little teaser on the next part. That's better. So I'll just play through this. It's going to be really quick. But as you can imagine, it just did a spot drill. If I zoom in real close, that's a nice 10 thou corner break on that dowel hole and a nice 10 thou corner break on that counterboard. So we can make sure to get a constant uh, chip break on all the holes that need it. So that's nice. But that's not all I can do. What if we have chamfers that need to be different for each hole? Now, in this situation, I have, if I switch to this guy and clear some of the stuff off my screen, you can see here I got some bigger chamfers on my dowel holes and more smaller chamfers on my counterboards, maybe to help the assembly guys have a much easier time punching those uh, dowel holes in and out. But um, in this situation, uh, it's the same kind of process. I'm gonna go to chamfer drill. And I'm gonna pick the top of these chamfers, but guys, just, just uh, a quick shortcut, or not a shortcut, but just a quick tip. It doesn't matter if you grab the top diameter of the chamfer or the bottom diameter of the chamfer in this case, because the lower Z level is gonna be taken into account with the smaller diameter. So as long as you've accurately drawn these chamfers, then it doesn't matter which diameter you pick but I tend to pick the top diameter just to keep consistency sake. Um, so that looks good. The green check. Once again, make sure my spot drill's picked. Go to my tool, cut parameters. And in this case, since they've already been drawn, I'm just gonna say zero, because any number I put in that box will just make it go deeper. So I'm gonna say zero, just like you would if we were doing say like a contour chamfer and you already have the chamfer drawn. Linky parameters, all good there. Green check. I'll send this to the verify again, just so we can see it. And I'm gonna play through it. And it's a little hard to tell, but you can see that the chamfer has uh, has gone to the size that I have drawn. And note, this also works if they're at different heights. So let's say for whatever reason, these counterbore holes were on a boss, that doesn't matter because once again, it's looking at where the geometry is located in Z and what diameter it's at to calculate how deep that spot drill should go. So I think that's gonna be a huge help for you guys who are doing a lot of drill holes and a lot of different countersinks. And so that way you can get it all into one tool path with one tool. You don't need to, you don't need to split it up for each countersink hole. Alrighty. So now we're gonna shift gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about the new advanced drill. And let me switch over to that part and maybe clear off my screen here. So this was a part I, I drew together. Um, don't really know an application of this part would be used for as opposed to my previous one, which is a, I thought would be kind of a fixture. But for this kind of situation, I want to drill peck through the top of this section hole. I'm going to pretend like this pocket's already here. And then I'd like to not necessarily wrap it, but speed through this empty section without pecking. Now, how would I do that before was I would either have to write it out manually with the G code, which is not what we prefer or we'd have to get a post edit made to get a custom drill cycle for this particular situation and hopefully for others. Um, so definitely not the most, not the greatest situation or solutions. But in 2021, they've added what's known as advanced drill. And I'll pick the top of this hole. For my tool, I got like a one inch drill, no big deal there. Go to my cut parameters and on the entire opposite side of the spectrum where the chamfer drill was pretty torn down and. Uh, very simple. This one is very complicated and that's that's by design because we want you to have complete control over what this drill is doing. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add some segments here to this table. I usually add more than I need then delete them afterwards. It's no big deal. Um, so for the depth, I'm just going to click in there and I can measure it. Note, I have my part sitting 
above Z0. So if this face just so happened to be on Z0, I wouldn't have to, I could just pick the Z depths, but since it's above, it's incremental from the top. So I'm just gonna say measure from here to here. And I'm gonna make sure to put a negative there because direction is important. When we give you all the, this control, we gotta determine which direction we're going. Speed rate, I'll say 15 inches a minute. Note that these numbers aren't gonna be anything I'd actually use just for demonstration. What way do I want my spin rule to go? Clockwise, counterclockwise, off. I'll give it an RPM, say 300 RPM. Um, and I'll turn the coolant on flood. Down here with this segment selected, I could say, hey, um, I need tip compensation. So send the tip, the 118 degree tip all the way through. And then I'll extend the depth. Note, we have to put a negative in this too. So I'll say 100 thou, negative 100 thou. But you could put a positive number in there and it would stay off the hole by 100 thou or the bottom of the hole that you pick. I'll tell it to peck. I'll say chip break. And since this is three inches, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. So 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, and then make that chip break a little smaller, like 0 0.05. I can add a comment. So I'll say uh, peck through top section. And once I click out of that box or hit enter, you'll see that it got added to this little list, which I'll get to in a second. We can also type in our own miscellaneous codes. So we could type in like an M00 or an M01, just randomly wherever we want. I'm not gonna do that here, but then I'll grab this comment here because I'd want that comment to be above the spindle turning on and the coolant turning on, but I can choose what order this happens in. So I can click on that, put it up at the top, and there we go, we got that segment done. So now we're just continuing through the process. I'm gonna pick on this depth and I'm gonna right click, distance between two points. Again, this is incremental from the top, so I'm gonna pick the top hole, this bottom hole. I wanted to, oh, I gotta put a negative in front of that guy, whoops. Negative in front of that. So again, I want this drill to speed through this hole because there's nothing there, there's just air. So I'm gonna say, you know, 45 in inches a minute. And just for demonstration's sake, I'll turn off the spindle. Don't need to put an RPM. I'll turn off the coolant as well. And I'll leave pretty much all this be. I could put a comment in there, but I'm just gonna keep trucking along. This time, instead of measuring from the top, I'm just gonna say a length of an entity and just grab the outside edge of one of these guys, just the length of my part. Throw a negative in front of that. Give it a, maybe a slower feed rate, maybe 10 inches a minute. Maybe a slower uh, spindle speed because we're getting pretty deep. And then maybe I'll turn on through tool. I'll make sure to say, hey, tip compensation. So it goes all the way through. And go maybe negative uh, 100 thou. Why not? I'll have the green check. And I'll get my axes out of the way so we can see the toolpath lines. Um, and we'll take a perspective like so. Oop, I gotta turn on my uh, turn on my section view and I'll put on show caps. So I, I, I split this solid in half so we can take a better look at it using section views. And I'm just gonna back plot this real quick. Oop, I forgot a key, a key, a key thing. I got ahead of myself there. Once again, we have multi-axis capabilities. And I made this top of stock 6.66667 incremental. Sear that out. And I need to get rid of this segment here. I got too excited, guys. Sorry about that. And I'll give this a pretty fast feed right out. There we go. Got too excited. And it looks like I'm missing something here because it's obviously starting above. Ah, that's right. Got to set these to incremental. Sorry about this, guys. That looks better. So you can really quickly just kind of change these tool paths to get them going. So I peck through the top, gets through, speeds down to the bottom, and drills all the way through. And I didn't add any packing on that bottom bar. And just the guys to show you that posted code, I'll post her out. And you can see here it's all longhand. So it, there's that my comment there, there's the RPM, there's the coolant turning on. Uh, we got it going at, uh, it's it's G1 moves, uh, G1s and G0s, and it's longhand. And due to the complexity of this toolpath, it's not very easy to make it into a can cycle. So what it is, is all longhand. 
Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, you can see it's going with a fee rate of 15 inches a minute, fee rate of 45 inches a minute, fee rate of 10 inches a minute at the very end. So definitely, uh, definitely working good there. Uh, and note that this toolpath can be saved off and uh, be used in other toolpaths. It could be or uh, can be used in other part files. So it's completely importable. So if this is a constant thing you're constantly doing, then you could save it off and just rebring it back up and you already have your depth set, you already have your fee rate set. So definitely a plus there. Okay, moving right along, we're going to jump to, whoop, let me go into our corner pretreatment. So um, I just threw together a little spur gear kind of looking thing here. And um, with the 2D dynamic, uh, what, what we were finding was when people were running their tools at the maximum speeds and feeds, at the maximum step over, to the point where even a slight change in the chip load could cause the, the tool to break, um, tools were breaking on these corners. When they were clipping around that corner, tools would break. Now note, again, you don't usually run into this unless you're pushing the tool to the absolute limits, but um, we would see that. And before we had some ways around that, we would say like we would put in an offset distance, basically creep our way into it. But it, that wasn't super efficient because it was offsetting the entire profile and not just the corners that we needed. So in the cut parameters, we would just say, hey, give a first pass offset or a first pass feed reduction, which wasn't really great because, you know, it'd be feeding through the entire section. So in 2021, they've added corner pretreatment. And as you kind of can see behind my window there when I went into the parameters here, it adds a second kind of pass to those corners or more. And when I turn this on, I can say climb, conventional, zigzag, corners only, or con corners only, include corners. So if I wanted this, like maybe for whatever reason, I'd want to do the corners with a different tool, maybe one that's a little more beat up or one that uh, one that's uh, not necessarily going to be doing the bulk of the work. Depth cut order. I can change this by corner, by depth. I can change the step over. I can change the feed rate. I can make give different step downs. So I can do step downs on the corners, but not on the entire part. So a lot of control there. And you can see here, it's focusing on the corners. Micro lift feeding to the other corner. Micro lift feeding to the other corner. And if that corner was big enough to, to justify multiple passes, like say if my step over was smaller or the corners were a little bit bigger, then uh, it would take multiple passes per corner. And then when the corners are rounded, then it'll start doing the, the cutting action. So a way to kind of make it more efficient for you guys. And again, we can just post out the corners only if you wanted to say, have uh, a different tool do that trick, do that for you. Okay. Now this is gonna start kind of getting the lightning round before we get into the, the big, the big uh, multi-axis edition. Um, so I'm gonna go into the raster. This one should be really quick. As you guys are probably familiar, when you do raster, uh, you have a machining angle of zero to 360. So in this case, the machining angle is zero. So the, the tool is moving left to right, left to right, left to right. Um, or in this case, since it's zigzag, left, right, left, right, left, right. Um, you can see that's really good for these horizontal pegs or these horizontal islands, but not so great for these vertical and diagonal ones. Um, not very efficient. But in 2021, we added this in the cut parameters automatic method. What automatic will do is it will search the feature for the longest edge and then make that the machining angle for that feature. And as you can see, now it's efficient for all of these. Now, again, this is a simplistic uh, uh, demonstration, but as you can imagine, this could really help you out because it's, it's just going to try to find the longest edge and make that your machining angle. So good help there. All right, last quick one. Going to talk about blend. So blend got a quite a few enhancements. Um, of course, it's metric. Blend got a few enhancements, um, but I'm going to tackle basically two of them, the two biggest ones. So if you guys can recall from 2020, um, we got a new blend toolpath that makes it more modernized with our modern toolpath design. So it has the modern UI with the model selection and, and has the containment boundary tools that the other 3D toolpaths have, the modern ones. Um, but the one downside was we didn't quite have 2D yet. 
uh, we only had the 2D or we only had the 2D option. We didn't have the 3D option. So you know, this is what a 2D blend would look like, and this is what a 3D blend would look like. And what that essentially does is when you have it set to 2D, it's only looking at the step over from an X and Y perspective. So if you were to dive down into a pocket like it is here, um, it wouldn't recognize that it's changing. So therefore, it would um, it would possibly cut more material in 3D space rather than what it thinks it's doing in X and Y. And the old blend had that 3D capability, and we've added that 3D capability into the new blend now. So you got multi-threading, you got all the new tools with the modern toolpath, and now you have that 3D functionality. Again, this is only one of the enhancements um, added into 2021. Uh, there's also uh, a number of passes added to the cut parameters. So you could say a number of passes, and I have here, I just said like 100 passes. It actually gave me a pretty close toolpath to what I had before. But I could just say, hey, I want 100 passes. I want four passes, and it'll split it up equally between those two curves you selected. So again, really quick, there's more there. I suggest you guys look at the what's new and stuff for all these little little details, but that's quite that's kind of what's going on with the blend. And now we're going to talk about kind of the uh, the one one of the big ones I want to spend a minute on, and that is this guy right here, and talking about the automatic three plus two toolpath. Okay. So you guys may have noticed that in the multi-axis section, there was the addition of three plus two automatic roughing. Um, a quick note about that, uh, it, it works essentially like a three plus two tool or a three plus two configuration where you have a 2D or a 3D toolpath, new plane, 2D and 3D toolpath, new plane, 2D, 3D toolpath, and so on and so forth, and positional work. However, um, this is only part of the multi-axis license. So uh, if you have the multi-axis license, you can do the you you can use the three plus two automatic toolpath. But if you don't have a multi-axis toolpath, you still have access to doing full three plus two machining. Uh, you just have to do it the more traditional way of creating a plane, creating a toolpath and whatnot, create another plane, construction into a plane, and so on and so forth. So before we kind of really get deep into the automatic three plus two toolpath, I kind of want to give you guys a little a little clarification on its naming, at least from my from my understanding. Um, generally, what happens is when an automatic anything comes out, and not even with our software, anything come out comes out automatic. Uh, the first thing to come to is, oh hey, looks like uh, that's going to be an easy button. Basically, click a button, and we get a fantastic toolpath. Well, uh, unfortunately, guys, uh, I wish it was that simple. However, um, while I do not believe the automatic tag is inaccurate, I do believe that if you have this idea that it is going to be an easy button to basically just do three plus two like that, I try to snap my fingers, but I can't. <laughs> um, unfortunately, that's not the case. And the, I'll explain why that is. Um, the three plus two automatic toolpath, when, when establishing planes to cut at, it will have three modes. It'll have automatic, semi-automatic and manual and i'll even i'll even pop into one of these and show you so tool axis control you can see here it's set to automatic pretty bare we give it a search angle increment and what that boils down to is if you feel the need to make a plane here every 15 degrees you can make one um and where we run into problems is like in here so if i rotate this part a little bit no that is not coming from the back that is coming from a very, it's coming from a, 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 a what I would call a normal plane from this front here at first, and I'll breeze through here. So it's coming from what I would consider front at first, but if I start getting down deep into this, and it's doing its step ups, it starts coming from this angle. And what's happening is, is it's looking for the maximum amount of material, the maximum amount of volume it could take out mathematically so it's looking at what mathematically makes the most sense to cut out material and mathematically that might make sense because as you can probably remember from geometry or trigonometry uh, the hypotenuse of a triangle is the longest side so therefore you could get the most material out by coming in from an angle 
However, us as machinists, we know well, you're not going to get in that pocket very well. You're not going to get into these features that are normal to that normal to a regular plane. So, with flat out automatic, we we kind of run into some trouble. And I, I like to use this analogy, and I kind of came up with this when I was thinking about this uh, this webinar here. And the the analogy I thought of is like, imagine if uh, I asked a computer, "Hey, what's the fastest way from Indianapolis to Chicago?" Well. If we were to if we were to exclude Google Maps for a moment, um, it'd probably tell me, uh, you know what, it'd, it'd be a straight line, a straight line from point A to point B at a constant speed, at your fastest speed. But as a, us as machinists know, or drivers who don't have a plane or a helicopter, we know well we we can't. We'd be going through woods, we'd go through people's houses. We gotta we gotta take. I-69 to so and so. We got to take this interstate. We got to go on this exit. We got to go through this road. And while helpful and it's going the right direction, it's not wrong. It's also not right. So what I would recommend this toolpath be is more of uh, the automatic features be more like a compass, sending us in the right direction in case we miss something. However, where I think this toolpath really shines is the manual mode. So before I get into the manual mode. Let me talk about semi-automatic. So what semi-automatic will do is we basically establish what vectors or what perspectives or what tool planes, I'm going to say like seven different things that mean the same thing, um, what positions or perspectives does it want to take first. So first it's going to start with top, and if you guys don't recognize that, that's a that's a vector, a, a, a matrix that establishes the vectors. Uh, very similar to planes, and you select them just like you would planes, but uh, it it's read out like that. So it's going to do top first. It's going to do left first, if I'm mis if I'm not mistaken there. Um, and then it's going to still search for an angle increment after that. So if it if it sees that there's still an excess of material somewhere, it's going to add another tool plane. You can see that here. So if I go in the back plot and I roll through this, you can see it's doing the top, it's feeding back up. And let me clear off my screen here a little bit. So now it's doing the left side like we told it to. But now it's coming in at this interesting angle because it sees there's materials here that it couldn't get to. So it's once again coming out of what I would consider a strange angle. Because that's where it, mathematically it could get the most material. All right. So again, semi-automatic is close, but it's not where I think this toolpath really shines. I think this toolpath really shines with manual. Now I know that doesn't sound too or sound too exciting, but I kind of like to think of it as uh, back when I owned a stick shift car. I loved having a stick shift car. However, I can live with an automatic. I just don't have the control that I had with a stick shift car. Same goes for this. I want that control. So if I go into the parameters here, I go into axis control, you can see here that we've established these vectors. We have top, it looks like we have some vectors that would uh, that are off maybe some of the features that are on my part. So one of these angled faces that, I, that they've probably selected. And then from left and right and whatnot. And from there, you can see it's all coming in at angles I would expect because I told it to. So we're coming from the top. Now it's coming from the left, coming from the right, coming from the back, coming from the front, or vice versa. Yeah. So I think where the where the confusion might come from is like I said before, people will see automatic and think, oh, well, that must be an easy button. But I'd like to say that that's not where it's automatic. Where it's automatic is it we are giving it simple directions. We are telling it, hey, I want you to get this view, this view, this view, this view, and this view. And if I have it on semi-automatic, anything in between. And then off to the races. It still requires guidance. As uh, programmers, we need to give it that guidance to get a really good path. Now, are you completely out of the woods after that? I'm not gonna lie to you, no. Because this toolpath still has some things we need to keep in mind, like in this situation. You can see here, it's cutting underneath the part. 
unlike a 3D toolpath, we don't have a steep and shallow option. So we need to create more check surf or check solids. So if I go into my levels and I turn on this little check solid, extra check, you can see here, we have to create a solid to say, hey, don't go underneath there. That, that's a little too scary. And where this toolpath could potentially be really nice is where, say, for instance, uh, let's say uh, you normally do top left, right, front, back. You can save that toolpath out, import it, select your geometry. You already have your tool. You already have your perspectives. And you're off to the races again. So we can, if you know, if, like anything, uh, and I'm not saying this as an applications engineer. I'm not saying this as an applications engineer for Mastercam. Shopware, what have you. I'm saying this as a programmer. Um, with this toolpath in particular, if you know what you're doing, you could really program super fast on uh, a lot of these features and, and just get a basic roughing down. Um, however, there is a caveat to that. When compared side by side with more traditional methods, such as a OptiRough stock model, change the plane, OptiRest, stock model, change the plane, OptiRest, stock model, change the plane. There were, there was a time difference when it came to machining. The OptiRest and the different planes and the stock models were faster toolpath-wise, or, or uh, cutting, cutting time-wise, than the Automatic 3 Plus 2. The Automatic 3 Plus 2 had some catching up to do, but the way I see it now, is if you know how to use Auto 3 Plus 2 efficiently, you could sacrifice programming or, or you could sacrifice cutting time for faster programming time. Where I can see this being super helpful is where, say for instance, you got to get chips flying no matter what. You got to get that machine running now. You could throw a 3 Plus 2 automatic, throw it in the machine, have it roughing out all the stuff while you're programming the detail work. Because I know I get call after call saying, hey, uh, I program like this. I program one toolpath, I get it running, I'm programming the next program toolpath, and he's doing one toolpath at a time, which is definitely not the ideal, but I can understand the environments that cause that. And where this toolpath absolutely shines, where this toolpath is absolutely shines, is the linking between the tool planes. Because when it's linking, it is in constant, constant aware of where the stock is where the material is, and knows how to avoid it to get to from point A to point B. Everything's wrapped up into one toolpath, so it has all the information it needs to get from point A to point B effectively. And that's where this toolpath really shines, where on other toolpaths, we have to be mindful of linking these tool planes together so nothing crashes, nothing hits anything. So OptiRests and stock models will give you a faster machining time, versus faster or slower programming time, where the Auto 3 Plus 2 will give you faster programming time, but slower machining time. And again, you can use both at the same time. You could do a little bit of OptiRest. You could do a little bit of 3 Plus 2 automatic. You could do what I've seen people do before with this beta, um, or before when this was a beta. They used uh, the boundary wrap that Chris showed earlier to get basically a basic shape of their part with minimum volume, and then they've roughed to that with 3 plus 2, and then use OptiRest to get into the more detailed areas that needs to be faster. So once again, it has its strengths and weaknesses, and uh, I, there's so much more going on in this toolpath. There's so much more going on into a lot of these toolpaths that unfortunately I can't cover it in, in the span of 10 minutes like I had to here. So um, I hope that was helpful, guys. That's pretty much all I have for the mill. So I'm gonna cover here some of the lathe, mill turn, Swiss enhancements before we toss it over to Alex to close out the webinar on some of the lathe demo items. So we've improved solid chaining in lathe. Before solid chaining would always use a slice version of the model, which anyone that's used the turn profile function in lathe, you now, you know that it gives a much better representation of what you are and aren't able to turn before you get into any live machining. So it now uses what a spun profile, similar to the turn profile function. So just another way to reduce having to create wireframe in Mastercam. 
and my graphics showed up a little early there, but there's now a dynamic option as well. So before, if you were solid chaining, you couldn't pick your start position right off the solid model. You'd, you'd have to have wireframe. So the other enhancement here is you can now automatically select right along the solid where you want your particular start location to appear. We've also done a lot more with the 3D tool designer. And this is one I'm just kind of kind of blazed through some of the enhancements and one that I definitely recommend for people that are taking advantage of the 3D tooling and Mastercam to, to get deeper into it. So we have some additional options for the connection location of your holder. So you can see in my screenshot there, highlighted, you now have a reselect location. That's the dynamic XYZ nomen in Mastercam. And you can also select a named plane for your holder connection location. Just giving you a little finer control of where that's connecting to your turret. And then we also added another fine adjustment to the compensation page. So before you only had those three options to the left where it was an arc command or a point or just a single point or an intersection. So now, you know, depending on the model and the accuracy of the 3D tool that you're getting from a particular tool manufacturer, you can now really fine tune exactly where you want that compensation point of the tool to be. Because I know before, even when I would do, say, the three points option there, it would be off, you know, maybe a thou of where I exactly wanted it to be when I'm designing a tool. So now you can just use the gnome in there and move it around. So there's now an option, too, for multiple insert cutting definitions for a given insert. So this is handy for tools that have multiple cutting locations. So it might have a second corner for say a, like a back pass or maybe you're using some of those new Sandvik tool pass that are in there, the prime, prime turning. So you can have really as many cutting definitions as you want for a particular insert. And the reason we had to do that too, which blends into my next slide here, is multiple inserts are now supported in the 3D tools. So there's a lot of these lathe tools coming out, like the screenshot of the one I have there, where it's actually four turning tools in a single holder assembly. So you know, a lot, of, lot more people are getting in, into that. You know, Say you only have 12 stations on your turret, you can really expand the amount of tools you're able to use without having to swap them out. And now that Mastercam can support simulating and applying proper tool paths with really as many inserts as you want and cutting definitions per insert in there. And that also parlays into the boundaries of a given tool. So like this example I have here, you, you get visual screen, visual feedback on the screen of where the boundary location of each insert is on a given cutting tool. So this is going from the top plane for one of those side inserts. And then if I was insert, if, if I was adjusting the boundary on say the one that was going vertically that's, that's cut off on my screenshot, I can get the boundary exactly set of where I want that cutting plane to be for a particular insert on a tool. We've done a little bit on the simulator side in lathe. So anyone that's used lathe in the past, you'll maybe backplot a live tool, CNY axis tool path, and it looks all good. And then you get it over to verify and the tool or holder starts wiping through the part. And you're saying, you know, you're looking at the G code, you're looking at backplot, everything looks fine, but it still looks bad and verify. There was an issue that they fixed where it's respecting these settings in the control definition. So if you are getting any of that or if you experienced that in the past, you know, feel free to reach out to our support and we can help you modify your, your control definition so that it displays properly in verify. So then it'll match up with what you're seeing in backplot. And the enhancement on the simulator side for mill turn is like what we did for the milling side where the machine simulation runs right inside the Mastercam simulator. The mill turn simulation now also runs inside of there. So anyone with mill turn before when you would go to do the full machine simulation, it would pop open in a separate window from the regular Mastercam simulator verify. So now it runs right inside of there. And just like you would with regular verify, 
or I, I always call it verify, but it's now called the simulator. But what that adds to is now a lot of the tools that you didn't have in the dedicated machine simulation that were in the simulator, you now have access to. So like I have highlighted there, you know, you get all the different clipping planes and the verify compare and a bunch of other functions that are in the Mastercam simulator that, that weren't in the separate machine simulation. And then on the Swiss side, so we did a webinar hand, handful of months ago that, that Chad did where we covered how the Mastercam corporate Swiss approved posts work inside of Mastercam. So I definitely recommend for people with Swiss machines to check out that webinar. It's only about 30 minutes long, but we cover how all those custom posts work. But we made some enhancements to the pickoff cutoff or the transfer routines specifically for Swiss machines. So in the setup tab here, Mastercam uses a different method to calculate the X coordinate of a cutoff move. And this is controlled by a switch in the post. So what this will do is it'll allow for how a Swiss machine works calculating cutoff locations because it's a little different than a, than a standard lathe. And that also ties into the... Uh, my second screenshot is gone there, but the X tangent point is an absolute value in regular lathe where that's not the case on a Swiss machine. So that same switch that we turn off in the post will also support that when you're getting into Swiss style posts. Oh yeah, here's the, I skipped past the first image. So this is the cutoff switch. And then my next image here is the X tangent point calculation location. But that was only a couple small things there. The the two big changes we made to lathe here, Alex is going to cover in a in a short demo. Okay. Um, so I'll be covering uh, just a few little things here for Mastercam. Uh, some of it will be Milturn, and then most of the, the other section will be lathe. Um, so in Milturn, in previous versions, you had to have your jaws defined based off the parametric settings inside of Mastercam. So you were stuck with only whatever you can shape inside of the job setup for the jaws uh, in your component libraries. Well, now that is kind of gone, so we don't have to deal with seeing just this situation with generic jaws, however you define them inside of the program. Um, so now we have the ability to create solid functions. So if this side over here, when we were going through this program, you'd want it to be a collet. You, let's say you have a collet installed. So now we have the ability to create solid work holding for collets and for regular jaws. So I'm gonna go through that here in just a bit. So you would go to your machine setting. You would go into your component library. And this is a metric system part. So in here, you would be able to add your, your particular libraries that you would want to do. So we can always add groups here. And now we can add our collet and chuck, uh, collet groups and our chuck groups. And we can go ahead and add a new chuck. And then our parameters here, Back then, we only had the parametric. Now we have the solid entity. So we're able to create our chuck components based off of that. So we have our 10-inch six-child chuck here. And that'll bring it up right here. And we have this whole model here. We can grab the chuck. We can define its mounting position. And now we can see that particular chuck there. And we have the same ability to do that with creating the jaws um, as well as creating collet chucks now. So if I create collet chuck, I do the same thing now, solid entity. And I can grab that model that I have. So that's just a basic, you know, understanding of how to create the chucks 
Um, and then you can do this. It's the same process for the JAWS. You would just go into the particular JAW um, entity inside of that file. You, you, most of this gets pre-populated and you're able to make that uh, change, you know, mount max spindle speed through stock, all of that. You know, you're able to add those groups in there. Um, and that allows you to use that to your best customization. I'm going to save that, save to that. So when you get into a file that is more, you need that detail, you're able to grab and set those chuck jobs. So if I go to the job setup in here, instead of those generic chucks, I was able to grab these chucks that I made earlier. So I can select a new chuck and I can grab that particular set of chucks that I want. Same thing for the right spindle, I'll grab the collet. You know, I got the hard jaws right here. I can select those that I made earlier. So if I double click on them too, you can even edit them inside of here if you needed to. But here's that solid jaw that I created. You can display the boundary of how it looks when it's spinning versus a slice. So that's a nice thing. It shows you that ability in there. You could even change where it grips from, where you want the gripping position to be. So you can change all that when you're when you're creating these jaws. So here's an example now. Once I get it all up and running, I'm able to post this out. And you'll get a quick view of the uh, simulation again inside of the Mastercam Verify rather than the independent deal as as Matt mentioned. So I just needed to make a few changes to the turn part, which I already have preset. That way our turn doesn't crash into the part as it's parting off into our sub spindle. As you can see now we have the collet chuck available in scene as well as our six jaw chuck that we made. And I can go ahead and play through some of this. You can see where it'll behave properly, current gets parked. There's our pickoff cutoff. You can see it's grabbed it right where I wanted it. Job setup looks good. And the rest of the toolpath are gonna be what I'm gonna be talking about right now in just a bit. So, uh, as you can see, now you have that ability to use that solid work holding. So you can download wherever you guys get your chuck models from or you create your own solid jaws, soft jaws, whatever you'd want. But now you can have a direct representation of what you are using. With that being said, the last toolpath I'll be talking about is going to be the custom thread. As you can see right here, Make that smaller. You can see right here we have a um, a double thread on a rope style thread. So now instead of creating some sort of weird tool to work with that, you can use the custom thread option here. And inside of the parameters for these particular toolpaths, it kind of looks like that uh, function panel. So it's a little bit different than your typical traditional toolpath window. But you're able to pick your tool, your spindle direction, which one you're using, upper right in this case. Um, you can orientate the tool as necessary. If you're not using Melter, most of this doesn't really apply. Different options for retract and whatnot. And in here is where all the meat and potatoes usually happens as far as creating the thread. Uh, in this case, we used a parametric setting and we were able to use uh, a rope style and you have plenty of options in here. So you can make your buttress threads, your square threads, trapezoid basically kind of like the um, acne thread type situation. So you're able to create based off of whichever option you pick in here um, and you just fill in the parameters that you would know based off the size of thread you're working on. So if you don't know the threads, but you have a profile drawn on it as well, you're able to chain that particular profile if you picked it. You can always preview what the thread looks like once you're done creating the parameters, and you'll see what it'll look like.
so you're able to create how it wants to be um, cut, depths of cut, percentage of your tool, all of that, the, the direction you want it to be cutting in as it's going, how much stock to leave, you have your roughing here, and then you have your finishing. Again, you can change your directions, how much you want it to step through, depth of cut, all of that ability. So you have a lot of control for the way this is formed out. Additional clearances, start and end positions. So if you needed this to start over here rather than over here, you can choose those positions if you wanted it to be a reverse thread versus the thread it is right now. Uh, in this case, this was a multi-start thread. Like I said, it had more than one entry. So we gave it the number that it needed. Um, and it pretty much pre-populates a lot of what you worked on here before. So extra stock clearance for retracts if you needed it. And that's pretty much it. So it, it behaves um, like most of your other thread parameter stuff, but you're able to control and create the exact profile that you're looking for. So let me put that in to simulation so you can see the rest of this. So we've got that first couple toolpaths. Rough, there's that pickoff, cutoff. And then here's your red. If I slow it down a little bit, you can kind of see. Um, There we go. You see it behaving the way it needs to be. Creating that nice form. And that's pretty much it on this. Um, I can let this finish up here. I can fast forward it so we can get a finished result. But it's nice, you can see that work holding clear as day, away from any tool projections or whatnot. So it does come in handy. The chances are if I had that generic chuck on there, I'd probably whack into it in this situation right here. And there's your finished thread. Thanks a lot, Alex. Yep. So the link I was talking about here, the Mastercam forum, if you guys aren't set up with a Mastercam account, you can link your account right from Mastercam or one of our tech people can help you. But in the forum pinned at the top are in in-depth videos on a lot of the different topics that we covered today from the product managers at Mastercam. So there's a thread in there, for example, from Dave Canigliero, the mill product manager, doing you know 20 or 30 minute videos on each specific topic like the blend mill that Devin covered or the I think Aaron Eberhard the multi-axis product manager has some good videos up there of like the three plus two roughing so thanks again everybody enjoy the rest of your Wednesday and we'll talk to you soon